So thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Valerio Finocchi. I work privately in Rome. Uh, I will talk about uh, some few concepts of uh, uh, the introduction about uh, uh, preservation concept and then I, we will start talking about the tip. So first I want to say that the five commandments of uh, preservation philosophy is to go, as we said, superichondrally and superiostally. Uh, of course, this needs a little bit of uh, microsurgical skills. Uh, try to uh, save as much as possible soft tissues, uh, performing also a wide dissection in order to obtain a good retrieving effect. And we will talk later how to fix uh, these uh, properly. Uh, this, uh, this dissection is uh, amazing because uh, in, if your anesthesiologist is good and if your dissection is good, it will be a kind of bloodless field. And it's very important then to close all the dead spaces in order to reduce uh, the fibroblast activity. So I started to follow this kind of uh, uh, commandments and uh, uh, even I start to have very good results. Um, so for me, it's something that I really don't want to abandon. These are a few cases that I uh, did uh, uh, some years ago. So when we talk about rhinoplasty, it's a kind of a game of chess because it's very important to know very well the uh, macro and micro anatomy uh, of the nose to understand the healing process happen after the, the days after the rhinoplasty. Uh, try to have a, a very good uh, manuality, so it's very important to train uh, this kind of um, dissection and to have uh, very good instruments. And as Paris said, also it's very important to understand the artistic and aesthetic concepts. So. Uh, okay, so now start to focus ab uh, about the tip and the approach to the tip. Uh, uh, we have, of course, everybody knows about open and closed approach. Open is uh, why, what are the disadvantages of the open? It's not possible to see the skin envelope over the framework. So it is not allow us to see very well the lights and shadows. Of the, of the nose. Uh, we have a damage of the nervous lymphatic arterial venous system, even if there is a, uh, a few techniques like Dr. Kirill, uh, I've seen him uh, during Congress, he's suturing back again the columellar artery. Uh, the problem is also that we cut the pitangi ligament, which inside has also a lot of uh, lymphatic, uh, lymphatic vessels. Uh, we have uh, a slower recovery, uh, of course, it's more comfortable for the surgeon because uh, we have a very good view of the structure. And there is a little skin scar that if you suture well, there is nothing after a few months. About the close approach, it's possible to see very well the, skin, the details. We save a lot of structures. Uh, we have a faster recovery, no scar. Uh, of course, we need more uh, precise instruments, as we said, and of course, more manual skills. Uh, but everything you do in uh, open approach is possible to do in close approach. So what I want to say, first on message, is try to be prepared to switch from the open to the close because uh, um, you will see less complication rate. I, I've seen in my experience best results and very fast recovery. So this was my learning curve. I started to do rhinoplasty uh, with the help of a tutor. So it, for, it was difficult to, for me to understand the 3D anatomy. So the orientation was not easy at the beginning and my surgical skills were not very good. So uh, I always had uh, one tutor near me. And then when I, uh, my comfort zone uh, get better, I start to, uh, to do it by myself in open approach. And then uh, one day I decided to, to pass what, what I call the nightmare point. So I tried to do the close approach. At the beginning it was very difficult. I was really nervous. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, the time to do the surgery was really long, but um, 
I saw the result, I saw how the patient was happy after it, so I pushed myself to do it. So it's very important to go out of your comfort zone because it's after that that the magic will happen in my experience. So about rhinoplasty, we know we have many incisions to access to the nose. Uh, in open approach, we have the uh, columellar incision uh, plus the marginal incision. Uh, while in, in close approach, we can have many kinds of incision. Uh, we can have the marginal, the transfiction, we can have the intercartilaginous. Uh, so um, I develop a kind of classific classification to help the surgeons to pass from the open to the close. So uh, we start with the open one, then going to the open two, which is a little bit more difficult. Uh, and then we pass the nightmare point going to the C1, which has uh, more incision to get much uh, exposure of the nose, and then slowly going to, uh, to, do, to perform less incision. Uh, so the difficult for the surgeons uh, is more, but uh, the invasiveness, uh, uh, it will be less, so the, a better recovery. So let's start about the uh, open one is a classic open approach that everybody perform. So I want to show you this video. I asked to Barish to uh, lend me in order to show you how to uh, perform it. So we start with the uh, infracartilaginous incision to uh, have the outer rim graft. Then uh, we don't go directly to the transcolumellar incision, but we uh, first dissect lateral to medial the tip. So as we said before, we want to go superechondrally with the tip of the scissors or with the tip of the bisturi or uh, we also pre um, prepared the instrument, uh, a dissector to get uh, very easy uh, inside the, the, under the perichondrium. You start to go la from lateral to medial, but Dr. Eran will talk about it. Then we uh, swipe and we go to the medial cruise and we do the same at the opposite side. At this moment you perform the transcolumellar incision, you are cutting here the superficial mass, so in the, there is a, a space uh, between the superficial and deep mass which is easy to elevate uh, and you arrive until the pitangi ligament. Here at the level of the pitangi ligament, before to cut it, is very important to um, uh, put two stitches in order to mark the pitangi, so that you will suture back again the pitangi in the exactly in the right position at the end of the surgery. So here you are cutting the pitangi, and then of course you progress toward the dorsum. So this is the classic uh, open approach uh, uh, that every surgeon should uh, uh, be able to perform. So here you see very well under the perigondrum is possible to see the scroll ligament, the pitangi ligament, and how to suture back it uh, in position. So, this is the O1. Then we go to the open two, which is a little bit more difficult because you perform the exactly the same maneuvers, but you don't cut the pitang ligament. So you try to do all the surgery without cutting it. This uh, is uh, it's to stimulate you to uh, start to do maneuvers with less space. In this way, you will get a little bit uh, uh, better when you will start to do the close approach. So we have now to pass the nightmare point and we start to do the close one approach, which has a lot of incision. So it's kind of more invasive uh, compared to uh, the open approach because you are cutting uh, intercartilaginous, uh, full transfiction incision, uh, marginal incision, but you start to preserve superficial mass and deep mass. So uh, how to do it? You have to perform a marginal, uh, complete marginal incision. Of course, you have to do the infracartilaginous on the lateral aspect in order to, uh, to, to uh, do the outer rim 
flap, and then you do uh, intercartilaginous incision connected to the full transfection incision. So this way you will have a big exposure, so you will not be afraid to perform the septoplasty, the dorsum, and the tip. Of course, uh, is a easiest uh, uh, is a e the easiest close approach. Uh, it gives you a lot of visualization, good management of the tissues. Um, you have to perform a wide dissection in order to see very well the structure. Um, but you can start to see how um, the close approach can give a lot of uh, faster recovery to your result. And you can see the light and shadows of the nose. But there are a lot of incisions, so it's more aggressive compared to the open. Um, and uh, it happened that the posterior strut, if you do a full transfixion incision, when you suture back, as um, uh, Dr. Checker showed us, it can fall to one side, and this can give a sort of uh, deviation of the septum. But uh, I, I, I can say that I did for more than two years this kind of approach, and uh, I, will, I was very happy. Of course, I had some complication, but uh, it was easy to fix all of them. And these were some of the, my results. Then we go to the close two, so we start to do le less incision. So we don't do a full transfixion incision, but we do a amy low transeptal. So we start to, uh, to do less, uh, and uh, we, so we don't uh, totally open the mucosa of one side. Uh, is, uh, is, so we start to uh, uh, reduce the invasiveness, uh, we reduce the chance that the posterior strut can fall to one side. Um, it's possible to manage very well the dorsum. Um, but of course, there is less maneuvering space for the surgeon. So this is always to stimulate in, uh, to the surgeon to um, go toward the, the next uh, step, which is the C3. C3 is... Uh, um, the less, almost the less invasive uh, technique in close approach uh, because uh, we just do a marginal incision and a amylotransceptal incision. So it will be like this, infracartilaginous here and marginal on the medial aspect and only the amylotransceptal incision. In this way, we don't, know, we don't cut anything at the level of the internal nasal valve, so we don't ruin it. Um, but of course, this is much more difficult because uh, to see from the marginal incision until the radix is not easy. So it's very important to perform a wide dissection. I start to have results like this, so uh, uh, you know, uh, um, I still do this technique, is the technique that I uh, usually perform if I don't dissect the dorsum. Rarely, there is a, a rare case that you can do the C4, is when you have a kind of cases like this, where the tip is almost uh, already uh, in the in good shape, uh, and uh, with the preservation approach, we are able to fix the dorsum without dissecting the skin envelope. So the only uh, incision that I did was a amylotransceptal incision to do the septoplasty. And of course, a uh, uh, little cut at the level of the piriform aperture to perform my uh, low to low osteotomies and from outside to do my transverse and radix uh, osteotomy. And this was uh, the result that I had during the surgery. So this my, is my proposal to start from the open to the close. But there is another way to learn uh, this technique. You can start directly in close C3. And let's say if you have any problem during the surgery, you can safely uh, uh, go to the open two. And if you don't want to do the open two, you can go to the open one. So I prepare a video to show you how to do it. So first uh, you do all the dissection as we showed before, but without the columellar incision. Okay, so you dissect the tip, you dissect all the dorsum. 
you do a wide dissection. Then let's say you don't feel comfortable. So you, want, you say, okay, no, I want to do uh, the rhinoplasty the, uh, in open approach. Okay, no problem. You do the transcolumellar incision. You cut the superficial mass as we showed before. And then here you have the deep uh, smas, the pitangil ligament. You can really see how this mass divide in two branches. The superficial mass going in the columella and the deep mass going in the intracrura ligament is part of the membranous septum. Then if you live like this, this is an open tube. So you can do the surgery like this. Uh, but uh, if you don't feel comfortable, okay, let's cut it, but mark it before, and then you do your, uh, your surgery. So this is a way to learn the close approach because you can start to perform the first step of the close approach and then go to the open. Okay, so in conclusion, start in open just for learning anatomy and dissection. And as soon as you gain self-confidence, please move to the close approach. If you have any problem during this, this close approach, you can safely convert in open approach. And if you can try to preserve the dorsum, but it's not, well, not always possible, but we will talk about the dorsum tomorrow. Now, I want to do the second presentation, uh, which is, uh, about uh, um, scroll area. Okay, scroll area reconstruction, because as Dr. Checker mentioned before, it's very important to control uh, the redraping of the skin envelope in order to have uh, a very good definition and redraping of the nose. So I want to show you uh, this, uh, how I do it. Uh, as you can see here, we have a long, uh, a lot of the skin, and we have to control the skin redraping. So, how to do it? By preserving the pitangi ligament and uh, by uh, reconstructing the scroll area. The scroll area has a longitudinal part and a vertical part. Okay, so when you dissect the cephalic portion of the lower lateral cartilage. You don't have many surgeons that do a mistake. It's not a mistake, but it's, you don't preserve the scroll. You have to go under the scroll. So you have to uh, um, try to pass uh, under this, the uh, scroll uh, cartilages. Many other people try to go over it. And in this way, they leave uh, the scroll uh, in the middle uh, between the upper lateral and lower lateral. But if you go under it, you leave the scroll um, cartilage on the roof uh, of the soft tissue envelope. And in this way, you will be able to reconstruct at the end of the surgery because there will be something that you can grab with the stitches and pull laterally, okay? So in open approach, if you want to do an open, no problem. But remember, you have to fix back the pitangi ligament. So the this is very important to uh, avoid any fibrosis at this level. While in close approach, we have to control, we have to control the redraping to avoid that the transversalis muscle can go here and create a sort of polybic deformity. So uh, how to do it? I do a transfiction stitch passing through the mucosa grabbing uh, the cartilage of the scroll uh, and then going back in the mucosa. Uh, I will show you here how to do it. So I'm passing uh, from the inside, passing the mucosa, I'm grabbing here the cartilage of the scroll and then I'm going back in the space. In this way, I'm super sure that the, the cartilage will stay exactly where I want. And as you can see, look at the effect I have on the skin. Look, I'm doing a test to see if it creates definition, and it does. So uh, then, if I'm sure that this stitch is good, I go to the second stitch. You can decide to put two or three stitches. It depends on the case. Uh, average, I put two. But if I want extra, uh, definition on the lateral aspect of the nose, I put three stitches. 
same method. So grab the mucosa, grab the cartilage, and go back inside the mucosa. Of course, not the, sa the same point. You have to do one cephalic and one caudal in order to obtain this kind of effect. You see, one side is totally uh, fixed and the other one not yet. Then I want to show you how to close the uh, infracartilaginous incision because when you do the alarin flap, what can happen is that the uh, alarin flap, if you suture um, the mucosa and you tight uh, the stitch, uh, it, it can happen that the alarin flap goes over the lower lateral cartilage and this can create a iatrogen uh, alar retraction that we want to ab avoid, of course. So first, don't tie it too tight. And second, if you want to be sure that nothing happened, you can stitch the mucosa. Then you grab a little bit of perichondrium and then again the mucosa. In this way, it will be impossible for the alar rim to overlap the lower lateral cartilage in its caudal uh, portion. So this, oh no, sorry, I want to, I didn't finish the video. Okay, so here, how to do it? Grab mucosa, then grab a little bit of perichondrium, and then grab again the mucosa. In this way, you will be sure that the alarin flap will not move, okay? I did it because I had few cases of retraction. It was, of course, my mistake. So I want to avoid this, and this is a good way to do it. Okay, now, just to show you the result that of the patient I showed before, as you can see, I had a good redraping of the skin uh, with the good definition of the tip. Probably there is a sl slight overprojection, but the patient is super happy. Probably it's not overprojection. Probably she needs a little bit of the chin augmentation. This is another case, as you can see, a lot of bulbous tip bulbous tip and uh, I changed the resting angle it's very uh, you can see very well how here there was a, um, a wrong resting angle and here you have a 100 degrees be between the upper lateral cartilage and lower lateral cartilage with good definition and creation of the polygon facet you can see very well the uh, redraping uh, and the definition of the tip Okay, I finish. Uh, I hope I'm in time. Yes, I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerio, and you're, you're quite in time. And uh, I ask uh, other participants to uh, pose their questions to you. And I have a couple of questions, uh, okay. if, if possible. Well, you began with your five commandments, right? Yes. No. <clears throat> uh, let's wait till they grow to ten commandments, well, like okay. Moses, right? So the number three, five, fifth one was to close dead spaces, close all dead spaces to prevent from fibrotic transformation and so on, right? Yes. Uh, we understand that we can close like suturing a scroll a ligament back. We can suture pitangi ligament back, but you, one cannot uh, uh, put stitches in between the, uh, the upper laterals or lower laterals and the skin. Uh, exactly. Envelope. So, what did you mean? Close dead spaces. We have uh, the only taping. I was mean exactly what you said. Control in position and pull the skin laterally. Of course, uh, we cannot do as you said uh, the level of the upper lateral, but we have external taping and we have compression with the right. cast. So this helps a lot. Right. Okay. Uh, um, we all were taught um, in the very beginning of our aesthetic surgery career that uh, intranasal incisions may be infracartilaginous, intracartilaginous, intercartilaginous, yes. or lower, medium, and yes. uh, um, so, and now <clears throat> you use intracartilaginous as a creating the rim flap, right? But also you use the terms like marginal or rim incision, and you use them interchangeably. Um, is there any place for the previous 
nomenclature of the previous years, or we have to change, um, which is your suggestion? List me the incisions which you, the uh, uh, proper terms to use. Okay. Uh, actually, when you perform the C3, uh, I do infracartilaginous to create the alarin flap, but then, of course, you go to the marginal. So it's kind of two type of incision. So lateral is infracartilaginous. On the on the level of the dome, of course, is uh, uh, marginal, and then to the medial cruise is marginal. This for the tip. Then right. for the septum, uh, I create the posterior strut, so I do any low transeptal incision. So I try to preserve the membranous septum where the part of pitangi ligament goes. It's a bit oh, more right. to the to the um, depressor septinacid. Right. Thank you. Are there any uh, other participants? Yes, my question to Valerio is about your type 2 of dissection with preservation of pitangi ligament. Do you have special indication for this dissection when you are doing semi-open, semi-closed? In what particular cases? Actually, um, I, I, the first time I've seen uh, this kind of maneuver, it was uh, in Moscow and you were performing during the live surgery. Uh, mm, thank you. For me, it's just something that I want to uh, propose in order to push the surgeons to try to go to the close approach. But uh, there is not particular indication for me, rather than trying to preserve and avoid uh, uh, fibrosis and keep uh, uh, more lymphatic vessels than is possible. Yeah. For me, it's mostly for doing structural rhinoplasty, when you need to use rafts, really in cases of post-traumatic deformities and, for example, after septum excision by ENTs. So there are indications. We will talk about that later. Okay, Thank you so great. much. Thank yes. you. Thank you.